Revelation 19, the coming of the Messiah. Well, let's pray. Father, we uh, just come to you now. I want to open your word as we, in, in a sense, uh, it seems like everything that John has been saying to us since chapter 1 is culminating here in, in these verses. When you return to planet Earth to establish your kingdom, this will be the answer to all the prayers uh, of all the church saints through all the centuries that we're seeing. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is when it happens. And uh, in answer to all of those prayers. So, Lord, we just pray that uh, in it, in your coming, uh, Lord, again, we would continue to see a, a greater picture, a vision, a more accurate uh, vision of, of who you are as our Savior, as the King of kings, uh, and the Lord of lords. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, in, uh, in chapter 1, uh, where we started, uh, we mentioned a, a key verse. Any, anybody remember that? It was like about 11 months ago. Okay, maybe you didn't remember, but uh, uh, it's actually been, been that long. It's been uh, just about a year ago that we finished up uh, Matthew and then uh, and jumped into Revelation. But in verse 7, it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. And then the fulfillment of that now is in chapter 19. Uh, verse verse 11. Before we get into it, I just want to say a couple of things just to, uh, I think we're all, all clear on this and have tried to make the distinctions all the way through uh, between the difference between the Messiah's first first coming uh, and his second coming certainly was an issue with, uh, with Jews in, in, in Jesus's day. What we're about ready to read that was prophesied through the Old Testament that he would come, establish his kingdom, sit on the throne of David, uh, rule and reign and so forth, uh, they were certainly expecting, and his own disciples thought he would do that in his first coming, and they just couldn't separate uh, those scriptures that talked about him coming and dying for the sins of the world, uh, of being the suffering servant uh, of Isaiah 53 uh, and of Psalm 22. They couldn't separate that because, again, in their oppression, what they wanted was a Messiah that would be that, that conquering king, and it was something that uh, his own uh, disciples uh, struggled with uh, and, and sometimes we do as well. I wanted to read a, a kind of a lengthy quote from Philip Yancey, a book he wrote a number of years ago called The Jesus I Never Knew. He said, there are two days that have earned names in church, on the church calendar, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Yet in a real sense, we live on Saturday, the day with no name. And what the disciples experienced in a small scale, three days of grief over one man who had died on a cross, we now live through on a cosmic scale. Human history grinds on between the time of promise and fulfillment. Can we trust that God can make something holy and beautiful and good out of a world that includes Bosnia, Rwanda, inner city ghettos and jam prisons in the richest nation on the earth? It's Saturday on planet Earth, will Sunday ever come? That dark Golgotha Friday can only be called good because of what happened on Easter Sunday, a day which gives a tantalizing clue to the riddle of the universe. He sure opened up a crack in the universe, winding down towards entropy and decay, sealing the promise that someday God would enlarge the miracle of Easter to a cosmic scale. It's a good thing to remember that in the cosmic drama, we live out our days on Saturday, the in-between day with no name. I know a woman whose grandmother lies buried under a 150-year-old oak tree in the cemetery of an Episcopal church in rural Louisiana. In accordance with the grandmother's instructions, only one word was carved on the tombstone, waiting. Though Jesus cast a vision for a better kingdom now and in the future, as long as it is Saturday, the fulfillment of that vision still awaits until Sunday dawns. Chapter 19 is Sunday dawning in terms of, of when Jesus come to establish his kingdom. Even as I was praying, this is the fulfillment of all those prayers when we prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that happens in, uh, in chapter uh, 19. The other distinction that needs to be made, not just in terms of his two comings, uh, but with his coming for the church and his coming with the church. And sometimes that's uh, confusing to people as well. Uh, it's in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, that Paul says that for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together 
with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. And so the, again, this is that word caught up. It's the Latin word rapto. We get our word, English word uh, rapture. So at the rapture of the church, which can happen at any, at any moment, uh, Jesus will come in the clouds for the church, uh, very distinct from the fact that he will, uh, at a point in time in the future, come with the church. A couple of the contrasts, uh, uh, again, the Lord comes for the church at the rapture, at the second coming. He comes uh, with the church at the end of the tribulation. At the rapture, the resurrection is prominent. At the second coming, it is not mentioned. At the rapture, the Lord comes to reward believers. At the second coming, the Lord comes to judge the earth. At the rapture, believers are taken from the earth. At the second coming, believers remain on the earth. At the rapture, there is no mention of establishing Christ's kingdom. At the second coming, Christ will set up his kingdom on earth. The rapture will happen unannounced. At his second coming, every eye will see him. So very, very contrasting different things that sometimes in the past, people have had a tendency sometimes to merge these two uh, into one events. And um, we tried to point out uh, uh, as we went through the book, have gone through the book, uh, all the places where we see the church is in heaven, worshiping God, singing the songs that only the church can sing while the tribulation is going on here on planet earth. And we'll see that when the Lord comes back to establish his kingdom here, he comes with his armies, plural. So there's more than one group of people uh, that are mentioned there. Well, let's go on in our text where, again, we're in verse 11 to verse 16. Uh, first, the character of the Messiah's second coming is, is described. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him is called, was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, notice plural, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So first we know this character is certainly seen in his uh, appearance there in verse 11, 12, 13, and uh, in 14. Uh, we see that uh, heaven is open. It's in a, a perfect tense. It means it's hope open. It's going to remain open. It's been open. It's open now. Heaven is open. It's going to remain that way. The description includes a white horse in verse 11, and this is meant to be a contrast to when Jesus came the first time and was uh, declared to be the Messiah when he rode on the back of a, of a donkey into uh, Jerusalem, and the people waved their palm branches, which therefore we call Palm Sunday, uh, and they're waving those branches, uh, saying that you are the Messiah. They're, they're proclaiming, uh, again from the Old Testament, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, you are the Messiah. Of course, they think, great, now you're going to set up your kingdom. And they were all very disappointed when he dies on a Roman cross three days later. This would be very different. Uh, and again, in the imagery of John's day, of Jesus' day, uh, when a Roman soldier went off to war, he rode the white horse. When Jesus came before, he came in tremendous vulnerability, willing to die for our sins. But that's not the way he's going to come uh, this, this time and we see that, uh, again, he comes to make, make war, uh, and that's part of the imagery here. His eyes make reference to the, uh, of his knowledge. Uh, they are like a flame of fire. It implies that he sees everything. Uh, he will be able to judge everything uh, precisely. Uh, Hebrews 4.13 says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So, when Jesus comes back again, it's to make war, it's to conquer, it's to establish his kingdom, it's to take over uh, planet uh, earth, uh, and he will do that, and his eyes will be like a flame of fire. Uh, notice three, the crowns on his head make reference to his authority. Uh, the term there is diadem, speaks of uh, not a, uh, a crown in terms of a reward, it speaks of his royalty, his majesty, uh, and he is adorned with many diadems 
Therefore, again, he is authority over all and in everything as he, as he returns. And then fourth, again, the plural, the armies of, of heaven. Who are they? Well, uh, one, one army has uh, fine linen, white and clean. And in verse 8, we saw last week already identified as, as the church. So we will, <coughs> we will return with him. So you better take those horseback riding lessons. But apparently these are angelic horses, so I don't think you have anything to worry about. But uh, we return with him. Uh, in terms of the plural, uh, the other army could be made up of uh, Old Testament believers, tribulation uh, saints. But Jesus said in Matthew 25, 31, that uh, uh, the armies of heaven when he returns include his holy angels. So you have more than one uh, army here that's, uh, that is returning with Jesus Christ. But as you as you read the passage and read other passages about his return, the emphasis is always on, and he will do, and he did, and he will, and he shall, and he, uh, we really don't, we're kind of just window dressing. <laughs> we're, we're observers we're, uh, as we come back. In terms of the battle and what happens, uh, everything is done by Jesus Christ. Uh, his robe speaks of his, his wrath. Notice his robe is, uh, is dipped in blood. Has nothing to do with the, the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's a picture of, of what's about ready to happen on planet Earth. Now, we've been through, and I, I think I've read maybe two or three times Isaiah 63, uh, because that's the passage that describes this when Jesus Christ returns to planet Earth, and he will go to the area of present day Petra, that area, southern Jordan or Basra in the Hebrew, where there's a remnant of Jews that are being protected by God supernaturally. The forces and the armies of the Antichrist are, are there and would love to, uh, to destroy them as they have already destroyed uh, so many of the Jews around uh, the planet. Jesus Christ returns there and then Isaiah describes his march from Basra to Jerusalem. And as he's going, it graphically describes the bloodshed and that his robes are stained with, with blood. And there's rhetorical questions. Who is this that's marching? How did his robes become stained this way? And the answer is, it's the Lord Almighty. It's the Messiah who is coming as the Savior to his people. And he marches at that point to the Mount of Olives, to Jerusalem, and eventually stands on the Mount of Olives, as generals in the past did when they declared their victory uh, in, uh, in that way. So again, his robes speak of his wrath, this judgment that is, uh, that is coming. Secondly, his character is seen in his his names, and that's uh, verse 11, 12, 13, and 16. There's four of them. And the first one, he is faithful and true. Uh, verse 5, John began speaking of Jesus as the faithful and true witness. In chapter 3, verse 14, he makes reference to that again. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things say the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So there's uh, uh, many things, and again, it's in a present tense, so uh, it's constantly being said about Jesus, that he is the faithful and true witness. And because of that, it means he's reliable. You probably wish you had a faithful and true mechanic. How about a faithful and true attorney? How about a faithful and true a politician? You know? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that then in life we wish somebody would step up and be faithful and true, and of course, there's... Uh, Certain uh, areas of, uh, of, uh, of the world or, or uh, of situations where, uh, you know, surely want a faithful and true doctor, you know, where you really need somebody to tell you the truth and do the right thing. Uh, and that's the name of Jesus that is being said, the idea, it's being said over and over again that he is faithful and true. Uh, David Hawking in his book, Coming World Leader, and again, the coming world leader is Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. Uh, and the coming world leader, he mentions five things or, or blessings uh, because of his faithfulness. One uh, is from Deuteronomy 7, 9 and Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Speaking of Jesus, Jesus makes, he's faithful and true. So he makes good on his promises, uh, all of his promises. Uh, secondly, he helps us in our temptations. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except uh, such as common to man, but God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape so that you may able to bear up, uh, be able to bear it. So he is faithful in terms of times of, of temptation. 
He protects us from, <clears throat> from Satan, 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. That's a good thing to know, isn't it? That whatever else is going on, and we, there is the evil one that's out there. Paul says in, in Ephesians 6, 1, to put on the full armor of God so when the, the day of evil comes, you can take your stand. In other words, they're, they're, uh, Satan is waiting, he's planning, he's observing, he's watching your life. Jesus said to Peter that uh, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. Uh, and certainly that uh, should be a concern for all of us in terms of that day of evil. What will it be? We should be praying that God would protect us uh, from it. But to know that he is faithful uh, and he will guard us even on that day. Uh, he is faithful, so he'll never forsake us. 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So again, God's faithfulness makes it, prom makes it possible for us to trust his, uh, his promises. Salvation is based on God's character and never our performance. The fifth thing is he'll forgive us our sins, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, from all unrighteousness. This doesn't uh, uh, mean that we can live any way that we want, uh, do anything we want as believers, commit any sin, and something suddenly wave over it. The magic wand of 1 John 1, 9 uh, what it means is that when we come before God and we're repentant and sorrowful uh, over our sin, he will always, every time, be faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So again, the emphasis, he is the true versus the, the counterfeit uh, in the true God is something that uh, John writes about in 1 John 5.20. Just a couple of, of verses that... Uh, are good for you if you have friends that are Jehovah's Witnesses or, or Mormons and those groups that uh, want to deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Uh, lots of verses that are very explicit to that. Uh, here's, a, here's a couple uh, more. He says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding, that we may know Him who is true. That's our subject. And we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God in eternal life. Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Jesus Christ is the true God. And again, the Greek structure there connects the true God in Jesus Christ and brings them together. It's very explicit. It's saying that Jesus Christ is the true God. Uh, and then Titus 2.13 says he's not only the true God, he is the great God. There, Paul says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And again, in the Greek, there's a, a definite article before the great God. And anytime you get a noun and a noun with the, the word and in between and a definite article, it's saying that these two things are equal. Jesus Christ is the Savior who is the great God. Uh, that's a rule in Greek. It occurs 256 times in the New Testament, and there are never, ever any exceptions to it. And, uh, and again, it's hard to sometimes go toe-to-toe -to -toe with those that uh, deny the deity of Jesus Christ, but pray for them that their eyes would be open because it's pretty clear in, in, uh, in Scripture. Paul says in Colossians 2.9, uh, uh, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Hebrews 1, 1, 3, the Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the mighty one. Uh, so uh, he is faithful and true, the great God, the true God that we can rely upon and uh, many blessings that uh, are ours is because of that. Those are just five. The second name uh, is uh, very interesting. I've read this for a while. Didn't really, uh, really get it until I studied it this week. He has a name that only he knows. Verse 12, he had a name written that no one knew except himself. Why bother to tell us then? <laughs> Call me cynical, but if you got a name and no one can know it, why bring it up, you know? But the idea is that it's, we, we can't conceive it. We, we can't get it. Because, uh, again, name is, name is character. 
uh, you know, when we, when we pray in the name of Jesus, uh, we're praying in the, in the character of God is, is the idea. Uh, so uh, there, there is still something about God that you and I will never know. Even when we stand before him someday, uh, and we have the, the full revelation of who he is and stand in his presence and so forth, there'll, there'll still be so much about God that we just cannot comprehend and cannot know. And I'd say praise God for that, because if I could figure God out, we're all in trouble here. <laughs> But uh, when we say he is holy, it means he is completely other. He is, he is, nothing, he is nothing, nothing like us. We're also told, maybe this helps a little bit, that his name is wonderful. Sometimes we, we sing that song, his name is wonderful. And we, we go on and sometimes we think that word means wonderful, like really good. His name is really good. Uh, that's not what the word means. Uh, it's used that way in Isaiah 9, 6, but also in Judges 13. Judges 13, you remember, is the story of the one Hawaiian guy that's in the Old Testament. His name is Manoa. Is that a Hawaiian name or not? You can argue with me later. Uh, he is the father of Samson, and, uh, and he has just had this visitation from the angel of the Lord. He doesn't even realize it's the angel of the Lord. Talking about the miraculous birth and, and, uh, and what this son is going to do for the nation of Israel and be a judge and so forth. And this issue of the name comes up in Judges 13, 16. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. He wants to uh, cook a meal for him. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord, to Yahweh. For Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? That when your words come to pass, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? In other words, you're not going to get this. You, you can't really comprehend this. So when we're saying and singing, your name is wonderful, we're saying we can't comprehend you, God. We just worship you. And, and, and you, you have a name, and there are things about your character that are so far beyond us, Lord. And, and so, again, this isn't, uh, and he's got a name, and, but I'm not telling you. It's, it's not that at all. It's just part of this when he returns, he returns, and his character can be seen in terms of, of his robe, of his eyes, of the crowns, of the diadems, and so forth, uh, the armies that are coming with him, but also uh, in these names. The third one is his name is called the Word of God, one of, certainly one of John's, it's John's favorite, used in, uh, in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with uh, God, and the Word was God, and then verse 14, and the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And, uh, you know, that word, word there is the word logos, which, uh, again, in, in a sense, it means um, uh, God's word in its entirety when it's used in some context, and, and we could spend a lot of time talking about it. But uh, really what it means is that John is saying, here is God's explanation of himself. Uh, in the beginning uh, is, is Jesus Christ, uh, and, and he is going to explain God wanted to present himself to the world. The world would understand who he is, what he's about, his character, that he walked this earth and cared about, about the, 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 the prostitute that's thrown on the, on the street before him uh, and others want to stone her. Uh, he cares about the, the person with leprosy, uh, the widow whose son has died and heals all that have sickness and disease, uh, that feeds everyone miraculously. Uh, when we want to know what God is like, we just look at Jesus. We just read, read the Gospels. Uh, he is the Logos. Jesus is the explanation of, of who God is. Who is God the Father like? Exactly like Jesus Christ. Who is the Holy Spirit? God the Holy Spirit. Exactly like Jesus Christ. He is the explanation of, of God. The fourth name indicates his, his sovereignty and in many ways summarizes the book. He is the King of Kings. Uh, and he is the Lord of Lords. Another thing that's interesting, you've probably got it in, uh, in your Bibles, you'll note it that it's all capitals and it's indented, right? I mean, it should be in about every, every translation and in every Greek manuscript, that's the way it is. It's extra large letters and it's indented. Uh, so it just, even in a, uh, a Greek manuscript, it jumps out. And in the English, they're trying to give us that sense. Uh, the way John, that's the way John recorded it. Uh, so important. When he comes, he is the king, he is the Lord, he will rule, he will reign, 
He's coming to establish his kingdom. So his character is seen in his appearance and in his names, but also uh, in the purpose of his coming, and that's in verse 11 and 15. Three actions uh, are described. He strikes the nations with the sword of his mouth. He rules the nations with a rod of iron. He treads the nations in the winepress of God's wrath. So it will be his purpose to strike the nations. Notice it's a, a sharp sword, therefore it will be uh, precise. And uh, uh, a couple of different swords or words for swords that John could have used. This is, describes a, a long one, long enough to throw even as a spear or a javelin. But uh, again, we have a, a different word, but the same idea used in Hebrews 4.12 where, uh, where God's word is described as a, uh, as a sword. Uh, and the idea that when Jesus Christ returns, the God who spoke creation into existence in terms of these armies that are gathered uh, in the plains of Megiddo and in Basra, and they've come from, from all over, when he returns, uh, again, as this conquering king, he will just speak the words, and they're all, they're all they're gone. They're toast. They're, they're, they're all destroyed. Again, we're... We're simply observers in, in the process of what's going on. He strikes them with the word of his mouth. It's a purpose uh, to shepherd the nations uh, as well. We get that with the word. He will rule them with a rod of iron. That word rod is a, is a shepherd's uh, rod. Paul speaks about that in 1 Corinthians 4.21. He says, shall, shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of, of gentleness? So it's the shepherd used a rod to correct the sheep. But notice this time it's a rod, but it's a rod of, of iron. So it won't be comfort that Jesus is bringing uh, as the shepherd when he returns. Uh, he will be shepherding the nations uh, with his sovereign authority. But uh, as the psalmist said, is in a sense quoted here, he will rule them with, the, with a rod of iron. Uh, and, uh, and again, this... This just means there will absolutely always be justice. When Jesus sets up his kingdom and he sits on the throne of David in Jerusalem, we are ruling and reigning with him somehow part of, uh, part of what's going on here in terms of his, uh, his uh, government for that uh, millennial kingdom described in great detail by the minor prophets, who's doing what, when, and where, and so forth. Uh, but in the process, nobody gets away with anything. Anybody does something wrong and they become for, <laughs> before for the judge, Jesus, he knows, knows not only what they did, why they did it, what they were thinking when, when they did it, and uh, uh, there will be no dream team attorneys to stand and argue before Jesus. He will rule with a, with a rod of iron. Uh, and it will mean that there will be peace on this earth because nobody will ever get away with uh, anything. Three, it's his purpose to tread the winepress of, of the nations. We see that in the last phrase of uh, verse 15, describing trampling the nations in God's wrath. And uh, sometimes the tribulation itself is described in that way uh, as a, a time of God's wrath. But this is really it when Jesus returns to, uh, to planet Earth. And, and once again, the idea of the, uh, Isaiah 63, what's, what's going on on there. The nations of the earth will be judged We'll get to it uh, as we uh, progress here, but next week, the establishment of the kingdom, that beginning, what happens to Satan and so forth, uh, a timing event and a sequence is given, and, uh, and after he returns, there is a period of time when he is judging the nations, and again, according to Matthew 25, nations will be judged based on whether they are anti-Semitic or pro-Semitic. It's all going to deal with how did they treat Israel during the tribulation, period, did they comfort and help? Did they, did they give a cup of cold water to one of them in Jesus' name? Uh, then, uh, then it will be rewarded. It will be recognized uh, versus whether they, they were uh, against uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, all that's going to be, be judged out. Nations, not just individuals, but nations will experience God's wrath when he returns. Uh, okay, so the character of the Messiah is described but also the culmination of his coming. Verse 17 and 18. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both great and small. A gruesome occurrence, 
but uh, apparently will, will happen. It will be the second time that it happens. It uh, is described as happening on a prior occasion. Two times it happens on planet Earth. Once in what we call the Magog invasion. Uh, and we say that because uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39 describe when uh, a leader of, uh, of Russia, referred to as Gog uh, and Magog, joined together with Mah Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. <laughs> His name is not actually there, but his place is Persia, which was the name of Iran for, for a long time. These are two countries that have basically hated each other through history uh, and fought each other uh, through history. And now for the first time in history, in the last 24 months or 30 months or so, they have joined together in a partnership militarily that they might link together and go after and attack the nation of Israel. We live in those days, exactly what the prophet Ezekiel said would happen. And one of the things that uh, will take place is, uh, is they uh, are working very hard to develop their nuclear capabilities. And as uh, Russia has now sold them uh, and put in place uh, uh, their best anti-missile defense system, uh, it will be very difficult for Israel to strike against them uh, militarily uh, because of that. Uh, and therefore, in a sense, they, they need us. And uh, one of their former uh, ministers of defense just two weeks ago in a public statement that was uh, in a paper in Israel said that we can't go it alone. We, we need the United States with us. So very interesting times that we're living in. Uh, but it doesn't really matter who they get or who they're on their side because God will intervene and he will wipe out uh, the, the armies of, of Russia in a confederation of Islamic states again, headed up by Iran himself. And when that happens, their carcasses will lay on the fields of, of Jordan and other areas where they've been st stricken down, and this thing will happen to them. The birds of the air will come and feast off of them. And it appears that there's some kind of nuclear exchange or something as you continue reading in Ezekiel, because he describes... Uh, marking their bodies and no one can go near and uh, and so forth. It sounds it sounds like there's some kind of nuclear exchange that that takes place. So uh, we could be very close to that time. But here's the other time when it occurs, and it is uh, at the end when Jesus comes back to planet Earth. He will basically uh, uh, destroy. The destruction will be so widespread that we we have an announcement from an angel. It culminates with his announcement. Notice he's uh, standing in the sun. Very, very dramatic. Who's that standing in the sun? Must be another angel again. What does he have to say this time? So we've had angels proclaiming the, the, uh, the gospel throughout the, uh, throughout the earth and every tribe, uh, uh, dialect and language and so forth. <laughs> we've had angels flying through heaven warning people not to take the mark of the beast and, uh, and so forth. And we have another dramatic angel here making this uh, this announcement. Now, Joel says that in that last day, the sun will be turned into darkness where there is an angel standing in it or in front of it, we don't know. But uh, 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 the position of the angel tells us the importance of the announcement. And again, the announcement is uh, the great supper of, of God. And it's in a loud voice, which always in Revelation introduces an important message, either having to do with vengeance or, or victory. And, and we've got that uh, here as well. Jesus may be alluding to this in Matthew 24, 27, for he says, when he comes again, as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. There's some commentators that think that's what Jesus is speaking about here. So these, uh, these armies, remember that uh, the Antichrist is in charge. He's got his armies and, uh, and it's actually, we saw it was actually demons that go out uh, and actually move the hearts of the kings, in this case the kings of the east, to cross the Euphrates rivers, which is dried, move on into the plains of Megiddo or of Armageddon. Uh, and, uh, and the armies of the earth are being orchestrated. Now they think that they're being drawn there uh, to destroy the nation of Israel once and for all. Uh, but we'll find, we find out in our text that uh, when Jesus Christ returns, they, they turn their sights towards him. Uh, so the character certainly is important that's being described. The culmination of judgment is also <clears throat> described for us. And then the final conflict in verse 19 to 21. When I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, 
And their armies gathered together to make war against him. Now notice that's not why they gathered, but that's what they're doing now. They're going to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. So the last couple of things about the conflict, it involves the armies gathered against the uh, against the Messiah, as I just said, again, they, that's not what they gathered there for, but uh, now that they are there, they are there to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his, uh, his, his army. So uh, very, very different. Something changes. They're there for one reason. Jesus Christ begins to return. It's all very obvious. Every eye will see him. We got flashes of lightning from the east and the west. Very dramatic. Everybody knows exactly what's going on. And they turn, in a sense, somehow believing that if he's coming to save Israel and we're fighting Israel, then we'll fight him as though they could actually uh, uh, do that. Uh, we notice also the final conflict involves the capture of the beast and the false prophet. And the, the reasons are given uh, because of the fact that it was the beast that, uh, that brought everyone to, to worship him. And uh, God says, uh, this is enough. I'm the only one that's going to be, uh, to be worshiped. This will be tolerated no longer, and it's the false prophet who led in that worship, deceived the nations with this false religious system that we spoke about uh, a, a few weeks ago. So those two things are given some, uh, some details there. Again, a dramatic reminder that uh, here's the final destiny, though, of, of everyone who rejects the mercy and the grace of God. Uh, they are cast alive. Notice they are cast alive uh, into the... Uh, uh, to the, the lake of fire. Now, when we get to chapter 20, we'll see that Satan later is cast into that lake of fire as well. Alive, they're still there. Uh, there, there is so, no such thing as annihilation. I like the idea, if somebody doesn't receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that somehow uh, they, are, they are cast uh, into some kind of judgment that lasts for momentarily, and then they simply cease to exist. They are annihilated teaching of the uh, Jehovah's Witness, and there, there are some uh, Christian theologians that have uh, uh, embraced that as well. It, the problem, I like the idea, uh, rather than to think of somebody burning in hell forever, uh, the problem is it's not taught in the Bible, and uh, certainly Jesus never, uh, never taught it. Uh, Charles Spurgeon used to, uh, at the end of some of his sermons, there at the London Tabernacle, a couple hundred years ago, uh, when the people would stand in two feet of snow outside just to hear, uh, hear him preach, uh, he would say to them on occasion, I want you to go home this afternoon, and I want you to take out a piece of paper and a pencil, and I want you to write one of two words on it. I want you to write forgiven, or I want you to write condemned, because you're one of the other, because no decision for Jesus Christ is, is a decision. And... Um, just uh, finished uh, a great little book. I'll try to get some uh, more uh, by Mark Cahill called uh, One Heartbeat Away. But he quotes Spurgeon pretty extensively in the last chapter as he's kind of very easy reading and kind of lays out all the reasons for faith and then uh, the importance of making a decision. And uh, I, I just feel like I know so many people in this condition. He said, uh, there was a man who was almost saved in a fire, but he was burned. Uh, there was another one who was almost healed of a disease, but he died. Uh, there was one who all, was almost reprieved, but he was executed. And there are many in hell who were almost saved. And, and that's the line that struck me, because I think we even say that sometimes. Is that guy saved? Oh, almost. I mean, we even use it in the vernacular. But of course, that means he's, he, he or she or they are, are not saved. And um, one of the things that uh, we kind of want to certainly take home from this as we enter into a time of, of communion uh, is the fact that uh, uh, Jesus Christ will return. Uh, the prayer of the saints of the ages for thy kingdom come and thy will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven will be answered. And this is how they're going to be answered. 
They're going to be answered by Jesus Christ returning and the character of those names uh, in, in the, the description that, that we saw. And those armies will be decimated and destroyed. He will set up his kingdom, and then he will begin to judge uh, the nations. Uh, and after that time is over, that thousand-year reign, then individuals will be brought to what's called the white throne judgment, where they will be judged as well. So the salvation is, is free. It's, uh, it's by God's grace, but it's a limited-time offer. And, uh, and so important for us to, uh, to realize that. Uh, as we take communion, we take communion because on that paper it says forgiven. That's why we take communion. In those elements are representation of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ because that's what saves us. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not that of works, so that no one can boast. It's uh, completely by, by God's grace that we're saved. Uh, he saved us not because of the righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, Paul says. And so if we write on the paper, forgiven, then we take communion because we're, t we're taking the gospel uh, in, in us and we're remembering what Jesus did for us. Uh, if the paper we write condemned because we've never decided, then actually we shouldn't take communion because Taking communion is saying we've received the, the gospel and we are forgiven. But, but again, no one should write on the paper condemned that's heard the gospel. Everyone should turn to the Lord, place their faith in him, accept his mercy and his grace in this limited time. And us as believers, uh, remember that uh, this is what we're living for in terms of heaven in all eternity. And therefore, it's our... It wasn't the great suggestion, it was the great commandment. We say commission, that's not what it was when we studied it. It was a great command of Jesus to go into all the world. And uh, our, our mission is to take as many boys, uh, girls, men and women to heaven with us as we possibly can. So when we take communion, we're remi remembering what, what Christ did for us and what's available for the rest of the world. And uh, like so many things in, uh, in this book, there's always the, the bittersweet in it, you know. I, uh, I have to confess, man, I couldn't wait to get to chapter 19. You know, it's like death and destruction for, for, for many weeks as we're going through the, the tribulation, you know. Uh, what would the body count be this week, you know, and, uh, and stuff. And about 19, Jesus comes back, he establishes his kingdom. But even in that, there's the, when he comes back, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, the, these aren't, uh, this is not a video game, right? This is not a sci-fi movie or something, you know. This is the, the real thing uh, when, it, when it happens, uh, and it, uh, it will be incredible. And uh, we just pray God would use us and look forward to that time when we're with him forever. But, uh, again, we want God to, to use us, you know. Right? Majesty, Amen. you are holy, you are holy.